today I want to touch on some of the uh, some uh, really qualitative properties uh, of the geometry of the amplitohedron. Um, uh, we already defined the amplitohedron last time, uh, both at trees and at all loops. Um, and uh, let me remind you what the definition of the tree amplitohedron is. Um, lives in uh, the space of k-planes in k plus m dimensions, and we think of it as the image of this c dot z map. Uh, so alpha runs from 1 to k, i runs from 1 to k plus m. We imagine that the z's are fixed external data, that live in g, that are positive in g, k plus m n, and that we're scanning over all c's that are in the positive Grassmannian gkn. Um, so again, the, the sort of picture is that here is gk k plus m, which is an m times k dimensional space. And if you fix the external data, there's some kind of curvy positive geometry that lives inside it, and it has boundaries of all co-dimension. So for some fixed z, you're sweeping out. That map sweeps out some particular part in gk k plus m. Um, and that individual m times k dimensional cells of c, so some particular k times n dimensional cell of c might map into some nice region inside GKK plus M. So this could be, this, this is an impressionistic picture, but this could be the image of some K times M dimensional cell of GKN. And so one way to cover the space is to find some way of triangulating it into pieces, maybe. Okay, each one of which might be the image of some collection of these cells. Okay, and uh, this generalizes what we have for k equals 1, and let's say m equals 2, where it's literally a polygon, and for general k equals 1, it's a polytope. So in this case, uh, it's a cyclic polytope, and in this case, um, any triangle in this picture is the image of some two-dimensional cell of G1n, G plus 1n, and there's a nice collection of these two-dimensional cells, and many of them that we can use to tile the space. Okay? So uh, the tiling is not fundamental, the space is fundamental. Um, we're interested in a canonical form uh, with logarithmic singularities on the boundary of this space. That's what the amplitude is with a little bit of uh, interpretation. But that's what the amplitude is, is the canonical form with logarithmic singularities on the boundary of the space. One way of computing the form is to triangulate the space and add up the forms for the individual pieces. And the forms for the individual pieces were these simple d log forms that we talked about uh, associated with every cell of the positive Grassmannian. Okay, and um, I already pointed out last time that just for simplicity, just for, uh, just, just stick with even m for a second, that already just uh, this formula, just the map quite straightforwardly, uh, tells you that y zi zi plus 1 is actually positive for m equals 2, that y zi zi plus 1, zj zj plus 1 is positive for m equals 4, and so on. So y i1 i1 plus 1 up to i m halves i m halves plus 1 is positive for general m even. 
And in particular, the case of m equals 4, which is what we care about for tree n equals 4 superangular amplitudes, this is locality. So we saw immediately how locality is a consequence of positivity, uh, that the only boundaries of the amplitohedron correspond to a situation where the projected uh, momentum twister data goes on a configuration where i plus 1 intersects jj plus 1. So that was a, a cool thing, because nowhere in the definition did we say that adjacency was important. Nowhere did we say that i plus 1 should come together, that i plus 1, jj plus 1 should matter. But we're seeing uh, that, that, the, that the points in space-time associated with the lines in twister space matter, and their null separation matter, just as a consequence of positivity. OK, so that was the tree amplitohedron. Then we had an extension of this at uh, loop level. And now we have not yet talked systematically about how to derive uh, uh, loop integrands. We're going to do that. Um, uh, we're going to do that next time. But I actually want to get some of the answers from the amplitohedron right now. It'll actually be easier. <laughs> Ironically, it's very easy to get, from, get them from the amplitohedron. It's easier to get them from the amplitohedron even than it is from uh, following the recursion relations. Okay? So we're going to get what the answers look like. Uh, and um, and uh, in some cases, we'll, we'll uh, compare them to some direct uh, computation using an extension of BCFW recursion relations later. Um, and actually, uh, in one of the exercises I'll do um, towards the end of this lecture, we get a simpler form that doesn't even come from BCFW. It's even simpler than what you get from loop, loop level BCFW. So that just shows there are many triangulations of this object, some of which are related to BCFW, many of them are not. And, it, it's not, uh, and so we're really just starting to understand um, uh, how to do this uh, systematically. But the qualitative point I want to make today, um, apart from showing you some examples of amplitohedra, tr tree amplitohedra, and even loop amplitohedra, um, I also want to show how unitarity emerges from the amplitohedron. Okay? So we've seen how locality emerges from the amplitohedron. I want to show you how unitarity emerges from the amplitohedron. We won't do it in utmost generality. We'll defer that to a couple of lectures from now, the last lecture on the amplitohedron. But we'll see it in some examples. In particular, I'll, I'll talk about the four-particle amplitude to all loop order okay? and uh, set up what the geometry problem is and show that that question is uh, uh, how it satisfies unitarity. OK, but to begin with, um, let's start with the uh, tree amplitohedron for n equals 2. Okay, so that's the simplest case that goes beyond polytopes already. So we're going to look at the tree amplitohedron for uh, m equals 2 and n e k. And at the end of last time, let me just. Uh, uh, remind you that it just so happens that the m equals 2, k equals 2 tree amplitohedron is the same as the m equals 4, k equals 0, another MHV, one loop amplitohedron. So these are exactly the same space. Okay, so what we're now going to do is understand how to triangulate this amplitohedron. And that triangulation is immediately going to give us the formula for one loop, uh, MH, the one loop MHV integrand for n equals 4 for any number of particles. Okay? We'll recognize that it's a correct formula when we derive it uh, uh, next time, but already we'll, we'll see some features of it now. OK, so, um, so let's talk about uh, how to triangulate the uh, amplitude in this case. And um, so let's. Uh, was there a question? OK. So let's begin with the familiar case, m equals 2, k equals 1, back to the polygon. OK, and let me draw this picture for the umpteenth time. So if we have a polygon, there is one very natural way of triangulating it. There are many ways, but there's one natural way of triangulating it as the sum of these triangles that look like uh, triangulate with the triangles 1, i, i plus 1. And if I say this in the language of the C matrix, which in this case is just the C vector, right? This is a C vector, which is a two-dimensional cell. Two, so m equals 2 times k equals 1 equals two-dimensional cell of g plus 
1n that looks just like c equals, you know, 1 dot dot dot, and then zeros everywhere except there's some xi and xi plus 1, and then zeros everywhere else. Okay, where all these x's are positive. So that's some two dimensional cell of G1n, and that two dimensional cell covers this triangle between in here. Now, okay, so once again, let's ask our blind friend the question um, how would our blind friend know? How could we convince our blind friend who can't see this picture that this collection of images of the cells of G1n covers the polygon? Okay, and um, well, let me just, uh, uh, all I'll do in this lecture, there's just a little bit more to, to really uh, fully complete it. Of course, in this case, it's trivial. Um, uh, but to really fully complete it for the, uh, for the general m equals 2 general k case, I have to tell you a little bit more that I don't want to tell you right now. We'll come back to it when we talk about the sort of uh, when we derive this winding number picture associated with the amplitahedron later. For now, all I'm going to prove is that all of these cells are non-overlapping. Non so I just want to, I, I want to prove that, that none of these images overlap each other in the, in the y space. And then, then there's a little bit more to say the collection of all of them actually tile the whole space, but we're already, it's already a good start, okay, if, if all of them are non-overlapping. Non so how do I prove just algebraically that these cells are non-overlapping? Well, Let's cheat and look at the picture for a second. Let's say I'm in this triangle. What distinguishes being inside this triangle versus being inside any, any of the other triangles? What distinguishes it is if I look at this sequence of numbers, y12, y13, y14, up to y1n. Okay, so let's look at this whole sequence of numbers. Now y12, remember all the i i plus ones are positive. Okay, so y12 is positive wherever I am. yn1 is positive, so y1n is negative at the end. And now you see, let's say I'm in this cell, right? That means that like y is on the right side of 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, all the way up to 1i. So all of these guys are plus up until y1i is also plus, but then y1i plus 1 is minus, and then it stays minus forever after that. Is that clear? So you see, wherever you are, if you're in this cell, so first of all, we, we learned something from this picture already. This sequence, y12, y13, up to y1n, wherever you are in the, in the polygon, has exactly one sign flip. It starts positive, and then it can flip to be negative. Okay, so it has exactly one sign flip. And we can label the place where the sign flip happens as i, and uh, i, and the, where the next one is minus i plus 1. And that labels the inside of this triangle. So that makes it manifest that two of these triangles can't overlap, because they just have different sign patterns. So they can't, there's, uh, there's no same y which can be inside both triangles, obviously. Okay? All right. So we're going to use this idea now to give a triangulation for the m equals 2 uh, amplitahedron for any k. So this idea generalizes for any k. Uh, the case of m equals 2 is really extremely simple, so we can really solve this problem in this way to the end. Finding a generalization of this sort of bottom-up way of discovering the triangulation for general m, and in particular m equals 4, is still an outstanding problem. Okay. So in other words, we know many triangulations of the amplitahedron for m equals 4. We can derive them from physics, we can derive them from recursion, but proving that they're triangulations, mathematically proving they're triangulations, and better yet, discovering them from the ground up, just from this, uh, the answer to this mathematical question is still an outstanding problem. But for m equals 2, it is a very simple answer. Okay, so, so here's the answer for m equals 2 and k equals 2. Let me tell you how it works for m equals 2 and k equals 2. So now we're looking for uh, 2 m equals 2 times k equals 2 equals 4-dimensional cells of G2n. And uh, actually we need, a, uh, if you think about it for a second, we need a little bit more than that. 
So let's say I have some, so the, the fact that it's a four-dimensional cell means that I have a two by n matrix. Let's say n is large. This matrix is going to have a lot of zeros in it all over the place. So obviously, it only has four degrees of freedom. Okay, but, um, but I know a little bit more. I know that uh, I have to have the property that every row contains at least three non-zero entries. If you think about it for a second, um, remember, we're trying to solve c dot z equals zero. And let's say one of the rows has only two non-zero entries. Then already, the top component would put a constraint on the external data. Remember, our external data now, the z's are, 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 um, um, uh, where in m equals 2, k equals 2, the z's are four-dimensional. Okay, so if, if we have, uh, if we don't, uh, yeah, so uh, we would put extra constraints on, on the external data that, that, that we don't want. So every row should have at least uh, three degrees of freedom. So remember, we're, we're looking at c dot z equals 0 for the, after we, uh, after we project through y. So for m equals 4, we're interested in c dot z equals 0 where the z's were four vectors. Now we're interested in c dot z equals 0 where the z's are two vectors. And so we want to have at least three non-zero um, entries in each row in order not to put some uh, constraints on the external data. OK, well, let me tell you what the answer ends up being um, uh, uh, ahead of time. Uh, the cells that triangular, at least a, uh, the analog of 1 i i plus 1 for k equals 1 is something that you can call 1 i i plus 1 j j plus 1 for k equals 2. So that's how we're going to label the cells. And what are these cells? These are the cells which have the property that they're non-zero in the first column. I'll come back to the signs in a second. And then in i and i plus 1 and j and j plus 1. Okay, so they're non-zero up here and they're non-zero down here. Let me not put. Okay, and otherwise they're zero everywhere else. Okay, so you see this is some analog. It's like as if in the top row there's a polygon, in the bottom row there's another polygon, but of course they're 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 unified in this uh, two by n matrix. I'll explain why this works in a second. I'm just telling you the answer uh, ahead of time, then we'll motivate where it comes from. Um, there's a special case if j equals i plus one. If j equals i plus 1, well, it's not that special. Just one thing, j is, I mean, it would look like star star uh, i, i plus 1, i plus 2. And OK, so this is perfectly fine. It's just that these things would be on top of each other. There wouldn't be a 0 underneath it. So generically, when they're far apart, they're zeros. But I'm allowed to have uh, j on top of i plus 1. And these two things would be non, non, non zero. OK, and, and then uh, 0 everywhere else. OK, so let's uh, actually talk about, uh, so now let me be more specific about what those uh, cells look like. I'm not going to draw any platelet graphs. It's so simple in this case, I'll just, uh, just coordinatize these cells in a way where it's manifest that the binders are positive. So um, uh, when j is, not e is bigger than i plus 1, the cells are just going to look like 1 xi, xi plus 1, yj, yj plus 1, and minus 1 here, and zeros everywhere else. Okay, so why do I have a minus 1 there? I have a minus 1 there, so these minors are positive. Okay, so this like 1i and 1i plus 1 are positive, and then so long as x and, uh, x, the x's and the y's are positive, um, uh, so long as x, y's are positive, then this is a matrix with all positive minors. Okay? And if j is equal to i plus 1, then this is nothing other than g24, just written in a very, very slightly unfamiliar looking form, but it's not that unfamiliar. And then zeros everywhere else. OK, so you see everywhere else is 0, and I just have something non-zero in four columns. And uh, I can rescale things to put this in our familiar form 
um, where this is like one zero zero one, and I rescale and I put not non-zero numbers up there. Okay, but yeah, um, but this is just another way of putting four coordinates essentially for a G two four, where I put a bunch of columns to a zero. Okay, so these are the two interesting. Uh, th so this is the sort of generic cell, and it slightly degenerates. It's not, anyways. They're all four-dimensional cells, so it just uh, looks like a G two four in this case. All right, so I claim the image of all these cells tiles the m equals two, k equals two amplitudin, and uh, let me once again show that it actually uh, that at least the cells are non-overlapping. So let's do an example. Uh, the first interesting example is for n equals five. Uh, when n equals four, just the amplitudin is literally the positive Grassmannian positive G24, so there's nothing to do. So for n equals five is the first interesting case. And so I have the cell that I would call one, two, three, three, four. So here the matrix is one, x2, zero, x3, y3, y4, zero, zero, zero. So I'm going to call this cell one. Then I have one, uh, two, three, four, five, where the matrix looks like one minus one, x2, x3, y4, y5, zero, 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 zero. And finally, one, three, four, four, five, where the cell looks like one minus one, zero, zero, uh, x3, x4, y4, y5. Okay, so these are all uh, four-dimensional cells. And I claim that these four-dimensional cells are the images under the C dot Z map are non-overlapping and that they'll tile the uh, amplitohedron. And so again, I'll just show for the moment that they're non-overlapping. And the strategy is going to be exactly the same. We're going to look at this uh, sign pattern for y12. Look at the sign pattern y12, y13, y14, and y15. OK. Now remember, y, any a, b in general, is just the sum over all these minors of c. I'll call them alpha, beta. These are the c minors times alpha, beta, a, b. Okay, so that's how we're going to just compute what all of these things are. Remember, we know that the minors of the z's are positive when they're ordered, and we know that all the c minors are, are positive. Okay, so that's, uh, or zero. So that's, so we're going to use that to compute all these signs. But as you remember, always i, i plus one is positive. In this case, it means that one, five, one n is positive and not n one, because of this f funny minus sign that we have whenever k is even. And OK, so, okay, so these two are fixed. <clears throat> so um, so uh, let's just look at what is y13 just from this formula. y13, uh, the only things that can matter, which don't manifestly uh, vanish, are, um, uh, are uh, where alpha beta runs over 2, 4, 5. So let's just write them down. So there's 2, 4. This is the C minor 2, 4 times 2, 4, 1, 3 plus 2, 5 times 2, 5, 1, 3 plus uh, 4, 5 times 4, 5, 1, 3. OK, now let me just uh, order these things. Uh, let me order them uh, to put them back in positive form, right? So 1, 2, 4, 3 is negative 1, 2, 3, 4. So let me put a minus sign here and put 1, 2, 3, 4. Now this guy, 2, 5, 1, 3 is 1, 2, 5, 3. So it's negative 1, 2, 3, 5. But 4, 5, um, it, uh, 1, 3, 4, 5, 1, 3 is the same as 1, 3, 4, 5, just m moving two of them across. And I don't change sign, so there is 1, 3, 4, 5. 
OK, so indeed, y13 is not guaranteed to be positive, right? Otherwise, we would have discovered it as one of the boundaries. So it's two minus signs and a plus sign. Similarly, y14 is now it's uh, 2 and 3 and 5. So it's 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, 4, plus 2, 5, 2, 5, 1, 4, plus 3, 5. 3, 5, 1, 4. And once again, let's, uh, uh, let's reorder everything. So this is, um, uh, this is just 1, 2, 3, 4 with no sign difference. Um, but this is 1, 2, 5, 4. So it's minus 1, 2, 4, 5. And similarly, this is 1, 3, 5, 4, which is minus 1, 3, 4, 5. So again, the same. Uh, there are two minus signs, and a plus sign is not guaranteed to be positive. Okay, so now let's look at what this sign pattern is in cell one, cell two, and cell three. Okay, so in cell one, so if I look at this sign pattern, y12, y13, y14, y15, always this is plus and plus at the ends. But now, let's look at what is y13. Now in cell 1, we just have to look at what are the minus 2, 4, 2, 5, and 4, 5. OK, and you'll see that, that 2, 4 is positive, because this is just sort of in positive g2, 4. But column 5 vanishes. So 2, 5, and 4, 5 are both 0. Right? So therefore, we conclude that y13 in cell 1 is negative. What about y14? y14 in the first cell. 2, 3 is positive, okay? but 2, 5, and 3, 5 are negative, are 0 again because column 5 vanishes. And therefore, we conclude that y14 is positive in cell 1. Okay, now let's look at cell 2. Exactly the same pattern, always plus at, at the ends. And now in cell 2, uh, <coughs> the first term, 2, 4, is positive. 2, 5 is positive, but 4, 5 is 0 because the last two columns are parallel to each other. Okay? Therefore, y13 is still negative. What is y14? The first term is 0 because 2 and 3 are parallel. The remaining terms are negative. So y14 is also negative. Okay? So, so sorry? y13 is uh, negative because uh, 2, 4 is, is uh, in this cell, 2, 4 is positive. Minor 2, 4 is positive. Um, the minor 2, 5 is positive, but the minus 4, 5 vanishes because the columns 4 and 5 are parallel to each other. So it's the sum of two negative terms. So that's why y13 is negative and y14 is also negative. Okay, yeah. And finally in cell 3, once again, this plus and plus. And so you can see that it's that pattern. OK? So, so we see a couple of things from here. First of all, uh, the cells are non-overlapping. Once again, these things, uh, these, these patterns are different. So the cells are non-overlapping in Y. Um, <clears throat> and uh, secondly, actually, um, if, if I if I remember what the labeling was for this cell, this was 1, 2, 3, 3, 4. This was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this was 1, 3, 4, 4, 5. OK? You see, the labeling is telling you, so in all cases, there are two sign flips. Okay? In all cases, there are two sign flips. And that's what you can actually prove in general, that uh, for the m equals 2, in fact, for any m, but uh, um, uh, the, the number of sign flips of this pattern is always given by k. Right? So in this case, we have k equals 2. So there are two sign flips here. And furthermore, the cell is telling you where the sign flips happen. Right? This is telling you that the, uh, the sign flip happens when I go from 1 to 2, uh, from it, that it's happening here. Right? So it's happening at, at 2, and then it, uh, it's happening at the transition from 2, 3, and then from 3, 4. So that's 2, 3 to 3, 4. Okay? The, this tells you that it's happened anyway. So, uh, so the, the, the labeling of the cell precisely tells you where the sign flips happen. Okay? And that's actually how you can go backwards. 
Once you prove, which uh, we'll come to later, once you prove that this, uh, this series has to have k sign flips, then you can tile the entire space just by saying, where do those sign flips happen? Um, <coughs> uh, for example, for, for, for any n and k equals 2, for any n, k equals 2, uh, this sequence has exactly uh, two sign flips. And the sign flips literally occur at y12, y1i, y1i plus 1, y1j, y1j plus 1, and y1n. And the sign flips literally occur plus minus here and then minus plus back here. Okay? And that's exactly what labels the cell. <coughs> and you can actually show that anywhere in Y that has the sign pattern can be obtained as an image of a, of a, uh, of a cell C that looks like this. So that's the, that's the way you can actually prove that this tiles, tiles the whole space. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's our first non-trivial curvy uh, amplitohedron. It's not a polytope, but it's kind of, it's pretty close. It's tiled by, uh, by something that, that, where each row of the C matrix looks like a triangle in a polygon, right? And uh, that's a special thing about n equals 2 that has that simplicity. It doesn't persist for, uh, doesn't persist for uh, higher n. <coughs> By the way, um, and and for, for general M, for general M, if one cares, general again even M, the cells are again the obvious analog. They're labeled by one I one I one plus one J one I two I two plus one I M halves I M halves plus one. And this sequence, y12, y1n, uh, sorry, general, so this is all m equals 2, sorry, m equals 2, general k, this sequence has k sign flips, and the flips occur, the flips occur at I1, I1 plus 1, I2, I2 plus 1, et cetera. Okay? Do you get this flip from the permutation? Sorry? Not, no, I mean, in some way, but not, uh, it's, in, in this case, it's, it's sort of very, very easy to just think directly in terms of what the uh, uh, matrix looks like. Uh, we'll talk about the, what the analog, we'll, 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 we'll talk about the, the relevant sort of playbook graphs for momentum twisters later. Okay. All right, any questions about this? Oh, sorry. And um, let's come back to uh, k equals 2. Remember, uh, so there's also a canonical form. So let's say for uh, m equals 2, again, k equals 2, which is secretly the same as m equals 4, k equals 0, l equals 1. The canonical form is just the sum of what I get from the, uh, the d log of all these variables in each cell, which I can then translate back uh, in, in terms of the um, solving the, the c dot z uh, equations. Let me just tell you what the answer ends up being. It's just, I'm just solving for the positive coordinates in terms of the z's. Um, and so this, this form is the sum over i and j d log y1i over yii plus 1 d log y1i plus 1 over y i plus 1 d log to four form y 1 j over y j j plus 1 d log y 1 j plus 1 over y j j plus 1 and again this is like this is very closely related to the to the form that we're used to for the polygon the for, the, for the polygon we got a two form that just looks something like this this is a four form which uh, has exactly the same form and if we uh, if we are thinking about this as one loop, the, each one of these y's is like an a b of the line in P three, the a, a b of the line in momentum twister space. 
So if I want to think about this as a one loop form, one loop MHV, then this is just AB. Or I think about that as the, again, as the line in P3 that corresponds to the point in uh, space time for the loop momentum. All right, and as I mentioned, we will re-derive this formula uh, sort of directly from recursion relations and see that we get sort of exactly, we get literally exactly the same, same thing. But here we just got it from triangulating the amplitude. Okay, so now I want to move on to, uh, so that's, the, that's our simplest uh, tree amplitude, and we understand it uh, for m equals 2, we understand it pretty much for any k. Um, and as I said, it's really an outstanding problem to figure out properly uh, how to think about the, the geometry and discover the triangulations and many other things uh, for general m. That's right. So the, you should think of this as, this as a four form. So it's a loop integrand. It's a loop integrand. And so then if you want to actually get the loop, it's the integrand. So if you want to get the amplitude, you then have to integrate it. Okay? Uh, so we're, we're not talking about the integration um, yet. Okay, so now I actually want to jump um, to, uh, to loops, and actually many loops. Um, and the kind of, uh, if, you re if you recall, the sort of general problem uh, had a lot of, had some moving parts. There was Y, there was all these extra D matrices and so on. Um, but I want to actually simplify. I now want to do uh, loops. In the simplest possible case, four particles, but any L, any number of loops. So now we're going to talk about um, uh, the all loop uh, amplitudehedron just for four particle scattering. So three loop, uh, uh, the, the three loop connection, should, is, this, is this more general? So is there something deep behind this thing that's any loop? There, there actually is, and we'll see it when we talk about the sine flip picture later. In fact, m equals two in a precise sense. Uh, one loop, the one loop amplitudehedron is an intersection of the tree amplitudehedron for m equals four and the loop and k and the uh, tree amplitudehedron from m equals two and k plus two. Okay, so in a very precise sense, you, in, you intersect those two amplitudehedra and that gives you the amplitudehedron for the one loop problem. And that's something that's not at all obvious from the definition of the amplitudehedron that I've already given you. <laughs> But, it, uh, but, is, uh, but is manifest in this other definition we have not yet talked about, um, which is the one that I've foreshadowed already a while ago, directly in momentum twister space with, this, uh, with the winding numbers and the sign flip patterns and so on. Okay, so, there's a, so I'm giving you the sort of more straightforward <laughs> definition of the amplitude, but there's a somewhat deeper one that actually makes many more properties manifest. And so it's not an accident at all that m equals two and k plus two is relevant for m equals four and k at loop level, and in fact, the story is literally the intersection of the two of them. Okay. So, um, and then there is something new that happens at any number of loops when the loops start talking to each other. <laughs> and so that's actually, so, so um, uh, that's what we're now going to uh, talk about. So it's sort of amusing because I'm jumping to something where our understanding of the geometry is at its absolutely the most primitive, <laughs> um, but it's such a simple to define problem <laughs> that uh, you can just see what the, what the geometry problem is that's supposed to give you four particles scattering to all loop order. And from the simple geometry problem, we'll be able to derive unitarity, like textbook unitarity. Uh, uh, whereas uh, when we talk about, um, uh, when, we, when we talk more generally about unitarity, uh, we have to talk about these uh, slightly less familiar things like single cuts and so on. We'll talk about it later, but I'm doing this problem because it's very simple to describe and we can already see something remarkable in how positivity generates unitarity, seemingly out of nowhere. So that's uh, okay. So so what is the geometry in this case? Remember, um, at n equals four, life is extremely simple. Um, if, if let me just uh, recall the general loop amplitudehedron. I was supposed to do this kind of uh, look at this big matrix where I have a k by n uh, part down here. So, so I have a big matrix curly C, telegraphic C. I have some k by n part down here. And then if I have L loops, I have a stack of 2 by 
L D1 through DL. Okay, a stack of two by n matrices like this. And I had to have this positivity condition that, that all minors of any number of Ds plus C have to be positive. So that was this extended notion of loop positivity. We'll call it G plus Kn comma L. And we also had Similarly, we have the space, here's y, is a k-plane in k plus, let's say, four dimensions. And then in the projection through y, we had L two planes in four dimensions. So these live in four dimensions. So we call these L1 through calligraphic LL. And so we group all of these guys together. So the full ample tahedron was y is uh, Telegraphic C dot Z, but in detail, uh, the Y was equal to C dot Z, and all of these L's were equal to D dot Z. Okay, so I'm being slightly slightly sketchy, um, but that was just the reminder from uh, last time. So that's the full amplitudeon for any K, any L. But life simplifies a lot. First of all, if K equals zero. I don't even have this bottom row, all right? And then I'm going to make it as simple as possible by having n equals 4. If I have k equals 0 and n equals 4, then each one of these d's is a 2 by 4 matrix. So each one of them is standard familiar positive G24. And then all I can do is take pairs of them together to make minors. Already three of them, I can't make uh, minors. Okay? So the statement is that I have a bunch of 2 by 4 matrices. And in fact, uh, if I think about my my loop variables, a and b, a and b is some 2 by 4 matrix d dot z, where d looks like each d I can, for example, put to the form 1, 0, uh, each di I can put form 1, 0, x, y, 0, 1, negative w, z. So this was a form that we use that where so long as I say that all these x, y, z, w are positive, then the individual minors are positive. But I also have to have this condition that this 4 by 4, for any i and j, this 4 by 4 matrix has positive determinant. Oh, sorry. So what is this telling me? This is telling me in terms of the parameterization of my line AB, if I want to think about it in momentum twister space, that A is parameterized to look like Z1 plus XZ2 minus WZ4, and B is equal to Z3 plus y, z2, minus little z, z4. Okay, so this is very concretely how I'm parameterizing my loop momenta. Okay, so I have four variables. I'm parameterizing this line AB by where AB intersects the plane 1, 2, 4. So that's, parameter, that's uh, captured by these two variables. And where this line intersects the plane 2, 3, 4, that's captured by these two variables. Okay, so these are four variables that capture the four independent loop momenta. Okay, so that's the, okay, so, and already for one loop, already for one loop, already for one loop, all I have is x, y, z, w positive. I have a canonical form, which is d log x dot dot d log w. Right? And as we've talked about before, this form is also d4za, d4zb, modulo gl2 over ab12, ab41 times some 1, 2, 3, 4 squared upstairs. Okay? And we can see that, right? Because what is ab12? ab12 is equal to. 1, 2, 3, 4 times the 3, 4 minor of this matrix. So AB12 is, let me actually write them all, let me write them all out. So we'll use it again in a second. So AB12, AB23, AB34, let me write it 1, 4 here. Okay? But 1, 2 is like W. 2, 3 is like 
z, right? It's the complementary minor. So I have a 2, 3 here, so it's the 1, 4 minor of that matrix is z. 3, 4 is the 1, 2 minor is y, and 1, 4 is the 2, 3 minor, which is x. Okay, so that's how I see the four poles, and it's a d log form. Okay. So, okay, so this is already fun. We've already talked about it, that we see just for one loop also what looks like a planar box where I have uh, the uh, AB is dual to this sort of point in space-time, and then I just have these four propagators um, associated with cutting the lines one, two, three, and four. Okay, so good. So that's the story for one loop. Um, what happens at two loops and, and above is that every guy by itself has to be positive in this sense, but we have extra positivity conditions coming from all pairs of these minors being positive. So let's just uh, write it down. So now we're talking about minors of the D matrix. So, so we, 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 must have, we must have that uh, all the minors uh, ij, sorry, let me write them down. 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 1, 4, 1, 3, and 2, 4. For every D separately, that these are all positive. But I also have to have this mutual positivity for any i and j. And I just have to take the determinant of that 4 by 4 matrix. And so the formula for the determinant is, uh, this is the statement 1, 2, i, 3, 4, j, plus 2, 3, i, 1, 4, j, plus 3, 4, i, 1, 2, j, plus 1, 4, i, 2, 3, j. So these are all positive, but there are two things that are negative. Minus 1, 3, i, 2, 4, j. Minus 2, 4, i, 1, 3, j is positive. So that's just a statement that the, that's just a statement that that 4 by 4 determinant is positive. So it's not guaranteed to be positive because there's some minus sign. So that's going to put some further constraints on these variables. On, so it's not enough for each guy ind individually to be in positive G24. Let's say that was the only constraint that, that we had. What would the form be? It would just be the product of many forms at one loop. So two loop would be like one loop squared. Three loop would be one loop cubed. Okay? So this is precisely the, 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 the extent to which it's not that trivial product is that there are these extra positivity conditions. And something that's sort of mathematically interesting about these positivity conditions is they're completely permutation invariant. Right? Unlike the other kind of positivity that we've been seeing where ordering mattered a lot, Right? Here, the, the ordering of the columns mattered in the sense that it gave a natural notion of positivity for each guy by itself. But this crucial new ingredient is totally permutation invariant between the different, uh, between the different uh, columns. OK, well, we can actually simplify this expression um, to a very, very pretty uh, form and actually phrase it as a sort of junior high school appearing geometry problem. So if I, uh, if I parameterize each one of the uh, matrices uh, like this, uh, the, the, uh, this is equivalent to saying, again, that all of these x, y, z, w are positive, but that we have this interesting condition, xi minus xj, zi minus zj, plus yi minus yj, wi minus wj is negative. So that's what that condition uh, turns into. And the junior high school problem is the following. So this is exactly equivalent to the following problem. Uh, look at the upper quadrant, just in the plane, and populate the upper quadrant with two kinds of points. Let's call them squares and stars. Okay, each square is the vector x, y. Remember, all these things are positive. That's why they live in the upper quadrant. And so there's one of them. There's square one. Here's square two. This is x1, y1. This is x2, y2. Here's star one. 
is now z y, sorry, z w, and star 2, z1 w1, star 2 is z2 w2. This constraint just says for every pair, the line between the squares has to point in the opposite direction of the line between the stars. That's it. Right? That, that's, a, that's just the dot product between the difference of these vectors and those vectors. So it just says that this arrow has got to point in the opposite direction as that arrow for every pair. OK? That's it. So the claim is the solution to this problem is all loops, is the L loop integrand for n equals 4 super angular scattering amplitudes for four points. And I hope it's apparent that there's, it really doesn't look like I got it from recursion relations or on shell diagrams or gluing or this, that. It's just some natural and in intrinsic problem in its own world. And now I'm going to show you how unitarity comes out of this. Okay? So it's just quite, quite remarkable. This little junior high school seeming problem is lurking uh, the nonlinear unitarity of quantum field theory. OK, before doing that, let's actually compute. Let's compute the two-loop amplitude. So this is going to be the world's easiest computation with uh, at least start with the starting point of a two-loop amplitude. But actually, we don't know yet. So for example, now what, so what, what, we're now going to look at this problem just for L equals 2 for the first non-trivial case and just going to triangulate it and see what we get. We don't know anything about graphs. We don't know that there's planar diagrams. We don't know any of that, right? We're just solving this geometry problem. We'll triangulate, see what we get. And at the end of the day, we'll see that what we get is interpreted as a sum of two two-loop diagrams. Okay? But, but again, we're not putting any of that into the sort of definition of this little geometry problem. All right, so let's do the two-loop n equals 4 amplitohedron. And in preparation, let me erase some blackboards here. <coughs> all of that was uh, all of that was motivated from this hiding particles picture. This entire thing was motivated from the hiding particles picture that we talked about last time. That, that you imagine hiding particles, the remaining matrices that you get have some memory of the underlying positive matrices, and that's all this mutual positivity. The, the amusing thing that I mentioned at the end of last time is that while you motivate this uh, positivity requirement from hiding particles, in the end, there are configurations of these C and D matrices that satisfy this uh, notion which cannot arise from hiding particles from a positive matrix. Um, if I, anyway, there's, I have very speculative things to say about that. Uh, but not, not here and not, not recorded, <laughs> okay? So, uh, but anyway, that's, that's where it came from, okay? So, um, there are no rules in this business. We're just trying to guess, okay? So, there's just uh, but that. But if, if I ignore this requirement, I would presumably get something non-unitary. Absolutely, yes. Well, in fact, if you, if you didn't say anything, you'd just get something very boring, just one loop to the L. Okay, so this is the only thing that, that, that tells you that it's not one loop to the L. Something that we're exploring now is that you can relax some of these. I mean, you can decide you're going to make, uh, for example, here at two loops, we can de de demand that, that this mutual thing is positive. Let's say you demand that it's negative. Do you just get garbage? No, you don't get garbage. You get another very interesting object, the log of the amplitude. <laughs> you know, one knows that in, uh, for MHV amplitudes, well, for all amplitudes, the amplitudes naturally exponentiate. <laughs> And the infrared divergences naturally exponentiate. So taking the log of the amplitude is a good idea. And at two loops, the log of the amplitude is actually what you get if you flip, flip the sign. Okay? Um, and uh, uh, so, so there are all the different sign regions probably mean something. Um, but for the literally the amplitude, it has to be that the sign is, uh, is a positive. So purely from the perspective of exploring the geometry, it's interesting to explore all possible sign, sign patterns as well. Okay? All right, so let's do two loop uh, uh, n equals four. Just a little quick aside, um, we're going to be writing down sort of canonical forms, left, right, and center. All, all we're doing is, and you'll see they're very simple. We're going to be solving for some variables in terms of others, and we're only going to find constraints of the following form. For example, 
right, we might find a constraint like some variable a1, the, everything is positive, a1 and a2 are positive, but let's say a1 and a2 is positive, but you know that a1 is bigger than a2. Okay? What is the canonical form for this one? Um, I, I can write down da1, da2, but I have to know that a2 is positive, so there's a 1 over a2, but that a1 is bigger than a2, so there's an over a1 minus a2 here. And if you wanted to do it very slavishly, you would parameterize these things in terms of some positive coordinates. You'd say that a1 is positive and a2 is a1 plus something positive, and you just write the d log of those positive variables. Okay? But it's so easy to do to just look at the inequalities and write them down for the uh, form. Let me do, um, so uh, we're not going to keep writing down the, the, the d's all the time, so let me just abbreviate in this case. I would write down for this region, let's say a1 bigger than a2 bigger than 0. I would write down uh, this form, 1 over uh, uh, a2, a1 minus a2. Forget the d's. What if I had a2 bigger than 0 but less than a1? Okay, so that's, uh, um, oh, sorry. That's, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, th this, is a, this is a more interesting example, right? Because, um, uh, no, sorry. That's all. That's all we're going to have. Okay, I'm not going to need anything fancier. Okay. So, uh, so let's just see how we can triangulate our region. So let's just look at our uh, let's just look at our equation. Two loop n equals four. We just have um, uh, just the equation x1 minus x2 z1 minus z2 plus y1 minus y2 w1 minus w2 is negative. Okay? And so without loss of generality, I'm going to assume that, um, that x1 is less than x2. And then we'll just go back at the end and swap 1 and 2 okay? to, do, to do the other case. Okay, so if that's the case, then I can divide, I can bring it to the other side and divide, um, and I discover that I have to have z1 minus z2 greater than y1 minus y2, w1 minus w2, over x2 minus x1. Okay. And so now you see the, uh, what, what, what's going to start happening. So I have to have that z1 and z2 are both positive, and z1 minus z2 is bigger than something, right? Now things are going to depend on whether the something is positive or negative. <laughs> okay, so the first case is where the something is positive. So the something is positive when, for example, y1 minus y2, either y1 bigger than y2 and w1 bigger than w2, or y1 less than y2 and w1 less than w2. Okay? And in that case, all I know, uh, I know that z2 is positive, and z1 is bigger than z2 plus this positive thing, right? Plus Okay, so what is the form for that one? So I'm not going to write all the d's upstairs, but uh, first of all, let's say from y1 bigger than y2 and w1 bigger than w2, um, uh, I have to have that y2 is bigger than 0, and y1 is bigger than y2, and w2 uh, is bigger than 0, and w1 is bigger than w2. And if all of that is true, I have to have that z2 is positive, and that, sorry, so that was one way. Actually, let's write down the other way as well. I could go the other way around. So, so I can just here, I can swap 1 to 2 here. And I can multiply this whole thing by 1 over z2 times z1 minus z2 minus this bracket. Okay? So you see, that covers one region. 
Okay, but I have another region as well. I have the other region, so this is one set of possibilities. Another set of possibilities is where y1 is bigger than y2, but w1 is less than w2, uh, or the other way around. y2 is bigger than y1, um, and w2 uh, is less than w1. In this case, this product is negative. Okay, and so if I bring it to the other side, then I discover that z2 is stuck between 0 and z1 plus something. Is that clear? This thing is now negative. So if I bring it to the other side, z1 plus something positive is bigger than z2 is bigger than 0. Okay, so then I just have to write for this guy. First, I have to write the conditions for y2. So I have to have um, uh, 1 over y2, 1 over y1 minus y2. But now w1 is less than w2. So it's 1 over w1. 1 over w2 minus w1 plus 1 goes to 2. And now what this multiplies is 1 over, and this is a little more, more interesting because z2 is stuck between 0 and z1 plus something. So z1 is positive. But z2 is stuck between 0 and z1 plus that stuff. All right, so this is what I got. This is what I got from case 1. This is what I got from case 2. And then I have to add, plus in the end, I have to swap x1 and x2. Because from the very, very start, I assumed that x1 is less than x2, but I have the other possibility as well. So I can just swap 1 and 2. That's it. Okay, so I just add all those guys up together, um, and I get the answer. Of course, there are all these spurious poles, you see? There are all these spurious poles in the sum that look like w2 minus w1, all these orderings. All these orderings were just you know, in our head for how we divided up this region. All those spurious poles are going to cancel. And the final result, do by hand or however you want, is the following, is x1, z2, plus x2, z1, plus y1, w2, plus y2, w1, divided by everybody, x2, x3, uh, sorry, x1, y1, z1, w1, x2, y2, z2, w2, and uh, our nice quadratic factor, x1 minus x2, z1 minus z2, plus y1 minus y2, w1 minus w2. Okay, so you see all the spurious poles are gone. And this is a sum of four terms. So let's see what the four terms are. Uh, let's look at one of them. Let's look at the, uh, the, the first term. See, the first term is killing the x1, the numerator is killing the x1 pole and the z2 pole. So let's, let's look at this uh, first term here. And let's see what are the numerators. Okay. Oh, I think I sort of uh, uh, I, uh, erased it. Um, sorry, if I go back to this matrix. Let's just remember again, AB12 is like uh, Z, uh, is like W, AB23 um, uh, is like 1, 4 is like Z, AB34 uh, is like 1, 2 is Y, and AB14 is like 2, 3 is X. So, uh, so let's see, what are the poles that I have downstairs? Oh, who is this one? 
Here I have two loops. Let's call them A, B, and C, D. A, B, 1, and A, B, 2. I'll call them A, B, and C, D. So this thing is, of course, just A, B, C, D. Okay, so that's something that involves the uh, two loops talking to each other. It's an internal, it's an internal propagator. Okay, we don't know that yet, but now let's look at let's look at uh, 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 let's look at everyone else. So the first term uh, it has in 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 variable one it's missing x, so it's missing x, so it means that it has a b one two a b two, three, a, b, three, four. And the second variable, it's missing z. So it has x, y, and w. So that means that it has c, d, one, four, uh, c, d, one, two, and c, d, uh, three, four. And then there's an overall a, b, c, d. There's an ABCD from this term. Okay, and there's some numerator that just makes all the weights work out, but it doesn't matter. One, two, three, four cubed. That's just there to make the uh, for the weights. But now look, that term we can interpret as the following diagram: a double box. Okay. One, two. Three, four. Here's A, B, and here's C, D. Okay. So let's see in this diagram, A, B, and C, D talk to each other. There's that internal propagator. I have A, B, one, two. There it is. A, B, two, three. There it is. And A, B, three, four. There it is. I have C, D, one, four. There. C, D, uh, three, four. There. And C, D, one, two. There. Okay, so you see I get a nice, beautiful planar diagram. I didn't say anything about diagrams. <laughs> we didn't say that there was planarity. We didn't say any of those things. But it's an output of this problem that this piece of the integrand is interpreted as that double box. Okay, and so what the geometry is doing is forbidding, you see, this could not be drawn as a diagram if I had all the poles, for example. If I also had a, b, one, four, that would not be uh, a planar diagram. If I had c, d, two, three as well, that would not be a planar diagram. But I don't get that. What I get from this term is just that picture. And of course, what I get is nothing other than from the four terms, I get this picture, I get this picture, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, plus, of course, it's symmetrical, so it's swapping A, B, and C, D. OK? So those are the four terms are the sum of the two double boxes. And um, you don't, at the moment, know that that's the correct answer for the four particle scattering amplitude uh, integrand at two loops for n equals four super angles, but you would not be shocked if I drew this picture for you. It's certainly legal looking local uh, processes. Okay? And we just got it out of this little geometry problem. OK. So finally, let me explain where unitarity comes from. So this is a uh, concrete computation. Of course, the triangulating in this bonehead. Oh, I, I should also stress this. Uh, you know, we wrote the answer as a sum. I forget eight pieces, right? Each we had four. We had four pieces up there. I forget how many cases we had. Anyway, we had a sum of some small number of pieces from just doing our geometry. Every one of those pieces that spurious poles, the spurious poles canceled in the sum, and so on. That does not correspond to any standard way of doing the computation in physics. It's not what you get from loop level BCFW that we'll talk about or anything else. Okay? It's, not, it's just something else, um, but it's the simplest way of uh, triangulating the geometry um, in this case. Okay, so now let me talk about the emergence of uh, unitarity. I think we can do it before Matt yells at us. Okay. OK, now I'm not going to do all of unitarity, but I'm going to do uh, one of the most textbook aspects of unitarity, which is the uh, optical theorem, or closely related to the optical theorem. 
And again, if you know field theory, you know all about this. If not, it'll look very, very plausible. This is a statement that if you put, if you have an L loop amplitude, if you have an L loop amplitude, and let's say we're just doing it at four points. If you have a four point L loop amplitude, and you put one of the internal lines, if you put two of the internal lines on shell, then the, uh, then the residue, where you put two of the lines on shell, first of all, on, on other grounds, general grounds, that corresponds to taking a discontinuity of the integrated answer. And the discontinuity of the integrated answer by unitarity has got to be given by uh, a cross section. So, but what it means, uh, uh, what it means sharply at the level of what it means at the level of the integrand is uh, that this has to factor. So if I put two of the internal lines on shell, let, let me let me draw it this way. So if I if I put like if I cut two internal lines, this is L loops. But if I just cut two of them, then what I should get is the product of something with L1 loops on this side, L2 loops on that side, the sum over all L1 and L2, such that L1 plus L2 is L minus 1. And the loop that I cut, the, 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 the two loop momenta that I cut are these two extra legs here. Now, let's try to say this more. Uh, let's just try to see what the answer has got to look like in momentum twister space. So this is what it looks like for, with ordinary lambdas and lambda tilde. This is very easy to guess what the answer is going to look like in momentum twister space. Okay, so let's say here is my polygon, Z1, Z2, Z3, and Z4. And now I want to imagine one of the loop momenta, so I'll call it AB, one of the loop momenta is going to uh, be cut. What does cutting it mean? It means that that line is going to intersect some of the external lines. So I'm going to imagine that the line AB, where it's normally generic, I'm taking a residue where it cuts 1, 2. So here's my line AB now. It's going to cut 1, 2 and cut 3, 4. So I can think of just actually labeling this as saying that the point A looks like, um, uh, let's say Z1, I'll put a minus sign here for future convenience. I haven't told you anything about the signs of x. So it's somewhere on this line. So I'm writing it as Z1 minus xz2. And this point B looks like, um, uh, let's call it Z4 minus yz3. OK, so I've taken my loop, the one internal loop, and uh, I've made it cut the, uh, the four-point polygon in this way. All right, now what do you think unitarity is a statement of? I, I'm, what do you think it should be? What, what, what should the statement be in momentum twister space that it factorizes into two things? Well, I took my original quadrilateral, and I now have two new quadrilaterals, this one and that one. So to just factorize into the product of those two uh, the amplitudes of those two quadrilaterals. Okay, so that's the statement of unitarity, at least for this cut, for this uh, for this unitarity cut. The statement is that the form that I get after I take a residue to uh, to to make A intersect the line one two and make B intersect the line three four, first. There should be something that tells me that A and B can be anywhere on this line. Okay, so, and it shouldn't surprise you that that form will just be d log x, d log y. But then, what I should be left with is the four particle amplitude, and again, this should be the sum over L1 and L2. But sum L1 for, let's say, this downstairs, uh, this. Uh, Uh, let's say this uh, uh, this upstairs quadrilateral, which I will call Z1 minus X Z2, Z2, Z3, and Z4 minus Y Z3. And the downstairs quadrilateral, some different number of loops, that 
Um, I will just write for convenience in this way. So you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. OK, so just to make it look more uh, symmetrical, this point z2 minus 1 over xz1 is the same projectively as this point z1 minus xz2. OK, so these forms are identical because all these forms are, are projectively invariant. But it's just, just convenient to write on this side something sort of uh, symmetrical to, to, to the other one. So this is the same point as that. This is the same point as that. Okay, and so all I've done is take this upstairs quadrilateral L1 and this downstairs quadrilateral L2. So to be very clear, I used to have a 4 times L form. I take two residues to make one of the loops intersect 1, and, uh, one 2, and 3, 4. And so I'm left with a 2 form, dx over x, dy over y, and then the rest should be the product of a 4L1 form and a 4L2 form summed over all ways of doing L1 and L2. OK, so that's a statement of unitarity. And so you see, it has lots of sort of qualitative features. First, you have to learn that on this, when you do this cut, somehow things split in two, right? That the problem splits in two. And that furthermore, it splits in two in precisely such a way to reveal the same problem at lower loops on both sides of the uh, cut. OK, well, um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to do that in five minutes. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's pick that up uh, next time. But, uh, but uh, let me at least give you uh, roughly, it's just going to take us 10 minutes, but literally take us 10, 10 minutes and not nine minutes. So, <laughs> uh, but so, so, so let me, uh, so we'll do it next time. But let me just tell you what the nature of the problem is. We will first go, we'll first, we'll, we'll call this uh, line, the special line uh, L. And we'll first look at mutual positivity, what the constraints of mutual positivity are between this guy and everyone else. Very beautifully, we'll see that the constraint of mutual positivity just between this guy and everyone else forces everyone else to fall into two camps. <laughs> they, all, they either have to have, you know, have one positive condition on one side or another on, on another side. And that those positivity conditions are naturally in terms of some shifted columns, where you shift the columns of the other D matrices by exactly the x and the y. That's exactly where these funny shifts uh, end up coming from. So just the mutual positivity between everyone else and this one line forces them to fall into two camps. And then, uh, and, and furthermore, um, uh, 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 because for each one individually, it involves doing, uh, it involves a new positive configuration with some, uh, with some shifted columns from the D matrices, the internal just to these positivities is unchanged because that's just the, uh, linear transformation, uh, four by four linear transformation on the D matrices that don't change the uh, determinants. So the internal conditions between one set and the other set are totally unchanged. And then the miracle is that the mutual positivities don't need to be imposed. Okay, remarkably, the mutual positivity between one set on one side and the other set on the other side, you just compute the minors on both sides and having ensured that they're all mutually positive with respect to this guy, all the mutual positivities are automatic. And that's why the answer just cleanly factorizes into the product of two things on both sides. And that's uh, just, just that naively looks like a little miracle. There's some computation with tons of plus and minus signs everywhere. All the minus signs go away. And the second you ensure that the loops are mutually positive with respect to the guy that you're cutting, again, they split into two different sets. And the two different sets are automatically mutually positive with respect to each other. Okay, so that's the origin of this, uh, that's the origin of this uh, uh, factorization from uh, positivity. OK, but we'll do that uh, in more detail again quickly uh, next time. And then we will um, uh, uh, come back down. Having seen a bunch of examples and seen what the answers look like, we'll come back down and sort of more responsibly derive them from uh, the all-loop recursion relation um, in uh, momentum twister space. OK, thanks. Yes.